Okay, my friends, so one of the ways that our ancestors used to train would be by candlelight because they didn't have anything else. They weren't trying to be exotic, but uh, by the equinox, it's getting pretty dark in the northern hemisphere. In the dark, it's much more touchy-feely, you might say. Okay, my friends, so that's how our ancestors would train, um, you might say sort of monk style, but uh, it's all done with the left and right hand of the boys being coordinated. And uh, let's see if we can see that. Might focus. Well, I don't really see it. So, <laughs> okay, hang on. It's kind of dark in here. Well, there we go. I think you can see that. So, that's shooting in the dark. And those are our hits. It's all touchy-feely. Uh, the right hand has to be able to relax to radius and eventually you will learn by feel that it's in the right position and then you'll be able to shoot in the dark also. But uh, anyhow, that's what we were after. Okay, uh, back in a minute. Okay, my friends, so again, practicing in the dark. That's so you can practice your form. Okay, my friends, so this is what we can do when we're uh, shooting in the dark. We get to practice our form, and uh, the left hand rolls the tip of that arrow on very quickly. The right is the anchor. That's where the pressure from the left hand is felt, but it's the left that aims. got here without uh, knocking myself out. Yeah, there's our hits. Those two are really nice and close, but uh, you can sort of see that uh, we can shoot quite well in the dark. Okay, boys. Back in a minute.
Okay, my friends. So again, we're shooting in the dark. This way we can shoot completely by feel. No idea where that one went. Okay, so there's a, a shot in the dark. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, you know, really, we got to roll that arrow tip on while the hand is way out there. Helps us line it up immediately. And uh let's see what we've got down here. I guess we'll have to walk down because I can't really see. Okay so there's our three hits. So we get a light on here. But, uh, yeah, with the lights on, uh, again, practicing in the dark, you can see that we can uh, shoot fairly well. It's just a matter of holding it on. The left hand is the one that aims. That's the one that points. And the right hand holds the pressure. And uh, that's where you press from. The right hand is so important. You have to be able to relax it. Radius your fingers, I call it. So that the arrow is pointing. But this is being done by feel in the dark. And uh, you can see... Where's the light? Anyhow, you can see that it's fairly dark. And uh, that's what we're getting. Okay, so that's what I'm training you to do. Okay, back in a minute. Okay, guys, so let's continue on training in the dark. Anyhow, basically what we want to do is to roll our left hand so that the arrow points right at the target and get it back, relax our right hand and uh, once again, I'm not going to turn on that, that light but you can see that uh, those are Real nice hits. Yeah, so it does work, you know. Aim with your left. Draw with your right. Allow the bow to pull your right hand fingers straight, which I call the radius. And when you do that, you'll get wango tango, your hits. Okay, boys. Back in a minute.
give you the gift of archery. In its simplicity and in its finer form. Tilt your head. Once you tilt your head, lift up your back foot and just put it down. Your head will stay on that angle. That's all you need to know for head placement. Tilt your head, pick up your back foot, put it down. You're in position. When you put your arrow up, you'll see that it will point off to the left if you're right-handed. Immediately, roll your left hand until the arrow goes straight. And your right hand, when you do that little movement of like that, your arrow will already be lined up to the target. Now you begin to draw with both eyes open, preferably, not necessarily, but both eyes open and draw towards your right eye. It's under the right eye that the aim is taken. So from out here, get that arrow very close to your right eye. And it's very easy to line up from that position. Not from out here, from here. Roll out here, but aim from here. When you get back, I use the occipital position. I take my thumb and stick it in behind my ear on the back of my jaw. It gives me a very steady anchor. Now I'm relaxing my hand so I don't have any tension in my arm or my wrist or my hand. All the pressure is felt on my fingers, right in the first joint. When that arrow is lined up, and if it's visual and it's daylight, not like in the dark where I'm training, just by feel, I'm also watching to make sure that arrow is 180 degrees towards that target. As it comes back, it's not a little left or a little right lining up all the time. So then again, once back, I feel all the pressure in the right hand. I'm pressing forward. Away it goes. <laughs> That's your lesson. That's your lesson for today. Okay, boys. So uh, I'll talk to you in a minute. But That's the archery. Remember, it's the 25th of December, the days are getting longer, the sun is rising in the heavens every day. <laughs> okay, boys, back in a minute. Okay, guys, so sometimes you're interested in my past or my family's past. Or any kind of tidbit of information, I guess. So, anyhow, here's a picture that, that uh, was taken of my great-grandfather, Samuel Williams. Uh, Samuel came from England about 1850 and uh, settled here in North America, in Newfoundland. I'll uh, show you something also. This is his rifle family heirloom that the government wants to take and take a hacksaw and you know cut a, a piece out of it so that you can't shoot it I mean just terrible but you can see that uh, here it says Harper's Ferry 1849 and it's got the uh, American Eagle on it Harper's Ferry is where the first battle of the Civil War was so that's the uh, rifle that my grandfather or great-grandfather used. Anyhow, he was in a boarding house or boarding school in England and him and his two brothers decided to 
leave England and come to North America and they came across on a sailing ship and uh, I don't know how he got a ship but um, uh, maybe he built it or perhaps his family gave him enough money to buy a ship because that's not easy you know never was but he had a ship and uh, he sent it to England sometimes to get uh, yard goods and uh, different supplies iron things like that the uh, he also sent it down to uh, places like Jamaica to get uh, molasses to trade and uh, also they would go down to places like New York and Boston and also get uh, gunpowder and flour and salt pork and uh, again molasses you know nails anything like that cloth people used to need cloth to make clothes uh, lots of fishing line and uh, lead for that you know so anyhow uh, he was a trader and uh, he had a store in uh, Fortune Bay, Newfoundland, in Pools Cove, which was the biggest store on the south coast at that time, I hear. And smaller stores would go to his place and uh, buy goods that he's brought in from other countries. So that was uh, my grandfather, or great grandfather. And uh, he was a religious man. He was born a Catholic and uh, came to Newfoundland and moved to a town, uh, Pools Cove, and it was a Protestant town. And it was very dangerous to be a Catholic in a Protestant town or vice versa. So anyhow, he decided to become a Protestant. And uh, he actually built the church or paid for the church to be built in Newfoundland, which is uh, a church that's still there maintained and uh, that's what he was doing uh, one thing that happened was that uh, his store burnt down or first store burnt down and he wouldn't let anybody go in and try to save it because of the kerosene and uh, the gunpowder uh, he was afraid would go off and, and kill people so he just got everybody to stay away and took a great loss there but uh, he was married twice, and uh, uh, he, he had uh, a couple sayings like, uh, none of us will get out of this world alive, which is kind of a common saying, you know. But uh, he also said, no matter how tough you think you are, there's always someone tougher. So he was the businessman. Uh, he had, again, two wives, and... Uh, he had uh, eight children altogether from the two wives, uh, one of them being my, my grandfather, Jake, Jacob Williams. And uh, the, the Williamses, you know, that's a, a common name in, in England. So anyhow, uh, this is the kind of thing that he was doing in Post Cove. And uh, when he uh, got really old, uh, what happened was he was actually having another ship built and he went down a border and they say he tripped and fell down and hurt his back and turned yellow and uh, died in about four days uh, and he was worried about his soul so he was religious but uh, I think what happened to my great-grandfather was probably he had liver cancer I don't think he just tripped and fell down on, on board the ship he was having built I think that uh, he was probably weak and very sick and uh, finally just fell down and um, that was that you know he just couldn't go on any further and the fact that he turned yellow that's a sign of, of liver you know probably the liver cancer got to him and uh, he's buried there in, in Pulse Cove uh, my mother said that when she was a, a little girl uh, she can remember his ship leaving the harbor and as the men put up the sails they were singing uh, we left New York the middle of May bound down for Newfoundland she remembers those words and uh, the ship sank in the harbor and um, uh, when she was a little girl and uh, I guess he was gone by then so she was just tied up and finally she rotted and sank in a, in a storm and my mother said that when she was a little girl, they would go out and look down in the water 
and uh, they could see the uh, the plates where the tide had pulled the plates out of the the galley, and they were strewn along the uh, the bottom of the ocean, and uh, the masts were sticking up for a long time. So at low tide, men went out and got saws and cut the masts off so that uh, boats wouldn't hit them, and uh, you know that's the story of. Samuel Williams. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that. Anyhow, you guys have fun. Have a Merry Christmas. I'll talk to you later. Bye now. I was going to get Missy to say goodnight, but she's uh, too busy rubbing her, her ear into my hand. Cats like to pet themselves for some reason. They'll stick their head right in your hand. Pet me. Yeah, she's a sweetheart. <laughs> Don't shake your head off. Okay. Have a good night. Bye now.